Got it. What's going on? Oh, just mind my own business, finishing up the house. Okay, great. Um, oh, great stuff, I know. Regarding Brian, I was looking at that. That's cool stuff. Yeah. And I'm reading that article. I'm saying, oh, yeah. We've got solutions on a lot of these things. It's interesting. Like, we're out of the ballpark. We're, like, in a different world, you know? Talking about factories, we're talking about bringing the factory out to the field. Kind of that that deal. I like it because I think we can contribute a lot to that. It's and a, also, like, digitize all of that. Like, digitize the thing about <clears throat> factory in the field. Yeah, through... Uh, Automation, digitization, the full model. Uh, you can add VR, AR, gaming. Uh, open source does it. That's it. Right. Agreed. Um, yeah, so do you want me to update you first? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So, uh, yeah, let me check in on a, on a the regulation stuff, yeah. I mean, the realistic story is it's not five days; it's going to be ten days. I still have to follow up and and basically get a a couple of more questions, because uh, even though it looks like, uh, uh, you know, ideally you'd go there and like every day you've got a, a scheduled inspection. Don't know how it's going to look, but it's. Um, my first impression was. No, it's kind of what I expect. Like about five. It's, it sounds like about five. Yeah. Okay. About five inspections. Mm -hmm. But I have to look into the details of it and actually say, okay, here's, okay, what does this schedule, here's a proposed schedule. Would that w work within uh, the building department? Right. Uh, I want to ask some very specific questions about that because that will basically determine, okay, is it like uh, eight days? Is it 12 days? <clears throat> what is it for for the minimum viable time okay because um i mean as far as execution i'm planning on <clears throat> way i look at it it's we're going to be limited not by our crews but by inspection schedules which mm -hmm. is an exciting thing to say right i mean that's not even in their ballpark in their consciousness for like uh, yeah i don't think they're they operate like the, the i could see that the my sense was that the inspection department they're like oh, plain assumption it's going to take a long time between between phases and therefore uh these kinds of issues of actual very specific timing never ever come up but so we're gonna to have to innovate on that basically make that see see how we can make that work right um, we're gonna to have to you know um proactively solve that issue because it's not gonna be like oh when can you do it we might have to negotiate with them say okay can we actually do this we might have to some <clears throat> some asks from them to see if we can maybe amend the process a little better if possible. We'll see. We'll see. But I, I got to look into the details and come up with a uh, coherent message back. Have you had additional communication other than the email, the response that John Pajor sent a couple weeks ago? No, no, no. Okay. I just took a look at some of the website. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would CC you and stuff. Okay. Um, well, yeah. the plan for last week was for me to research commercial buildings, uh, work on the EV application and connect to Brian Potter and follow up on some mentors. And then your focus was actual building a rosebud, working on the CAD and documentation and studying for the GC exam. So, mm -hmm. so those are, those were what we discussed last week. So on my end, um, at 10,000 square feet for a prefab steel building, you're looking at 160 before concrete and before installation costs. Um, I, I essentially narrowed it down to like three or four different options for commercial building. One is the prefab steel uh, within which you've got different designs, um, you know, different truss designs, different uh, anchoring methods. You have pole barn, um, you have uh, versus, versa tube, which is a prefab steel, but it's bolt together and it's not as fixed of a structure as a prefab steel building would be. And uh, just like a conventional frame, uh, or not conventional, excuse me, a, a kit build. So <clears throat> I've put these in a spreadsheet. Um, I 
I only got a couple quotes before I stopped returning people's phone calls because the way you receive, you request a code is you like fill out a contact form and then they have a sales rep call you and it's like this kind of frustrating process. But, but I mean, 160 grand, so like roughly 16 bucks a square foot at the 10,000 square foot scale and probably a six to eight month delivery timeline. Six to eight month delivery time? Now that's for the the like more well known prefab steel building companies. Um, the first like third of that is uh, working with the engineer to spec out the building. Um, the second third is like waiting supply chain issues, um, and then the final third is actual manufacturing and delivery. So so like right now prefab. Where do you have they have this? this timeline document somewhere or is that in your no, they, well it's different for every company but i i took notes on these conversations i have in the it's in my log under completed tasks for friday december 17th the spreadsheet yeah so you were just talking about north steel Right, but the, the price point months, is delivery time. Yeah, I mean the the I got the same quote from Great Western, um, and the same estimate from pretty much everyone that does the prefab steel building. And, and the the interesting thing about North Steel is that their office is in Toronto, but they use U.S. manufacturers. And I think that the sales rep kind of slipped up and and was trying to sell me on a shorter delivery timeline to their competitors. Uh, and they said that they use the same manufacturer as other prefab steel buildings in America, which makes me think that a lot of these companies are m like mainly design and engineering firms. And there's only a few manufacturing facilities that do this work. And so, um, yeah, just for what it's worth, like, I don't think there's a lot of uh, difference, I guess, in the great Western you show uh, and for Great Western, you show ninety-eight thousand versus one sixty for North Steel. Yeah, well, the that difference could easily be explained, like lots of different ways. Um, mainly uh, that, like truss design, will impact that anchoring. Um, yeah. And, and actually, now that you go back to it, I'm not sure the Great Western quote was actually for uh, a 10,000 square foot or for something smaller. But the, the, like, at the end of the day, these companies are really hesitant to give you a final number until you're done specking it out with their engineer. So this VersaTube, is that any good? Um. I think it's good for smaller structures. So I probably, I don't think it's, I don't think a 10,000 square foot structure would be a great idea. Uh, it, it's a more intensive or like more complicated build process because you're going to have to like, you can put up sheathing, but then you're going to have to come up with a internal framing and insulation solution. Uh, if you want to have people living in it, or if you want to have it be climate controlled. Um, for mm -hmm. the price though it's kind of hard to beat the price and it's you know it's not going to be as robust in the long term uh as like a prefab steel building but you know that may not be a priority for you right now um one of the cool things i, I found about this though is that uh the versatube system has prefab kits that are much much cheaper so like you can get a something like 1600 square feet um for around 30 grand um and so you could do a couple of those for much cheaper you would still have to pour the concrete um you'd have two separate structures now but um yeah and i think because they're kit buildings they have different um implications for like wind loads and snow loads and all that other stuff 
Um, they're not, they're like the North steel and, and the other prefab steel buildings will have engineers look at the condition, the seismic wind and weather conditions of the site and then engineer it to, to standard because it's, it's, it has to follow the same codes and safety concerns as if you were building a building. Mm -hmm. What are next steps on this? Well, <clears throat> what do you gather from this? So waiting for some more responses or what's your, what's your uh, take on the, all this so far? Well, I, I would say come up with a refined list of our needs, you know, mm -hmm. but it, it, we, we, we should probably narrow it down to like, what exactly are we trying to solve for with this? Is it housing and kitchen and bathrooms? And if so, that's going to drive a lot of the, like, like we've got, we've got a housing need. We've got a cooking kitchen facility. We've got a bathroom facility need and we've got a workshop need. And so like, mm -hmm. we need to figure out which of those things this building is trying to solve for, I think. And then, uh, work from there mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and, and basically like in, empower the search with more detailed requirements to get a more accurate quote mm So what's what should we do about this then? So so come up with that work and prioritize uh, getting that spec out there, or what do we do? Well, I mean, this is probably a bigger conversation um, about mm. that ties back to the glide path, right? So mm -hmm. I like the idea of you of you focusing as much of your effort on the refining the product and preparing it for releases as possible. Yep. Um, I think I think we need to make more progress on that before we have a uh, like refined timeline for the actual build. Um, there are certain things that have to happen before we can like start recruiting people. Um, but you know, I I don't know. I don't have all the answers here because I think this is this needs to be like a bigger conversation about what's the most important thing that we're trying to solve for. You're, are you waiting for some uh, further information back from some of these companies? Or I no, I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think I did the for this first batch of information gathering, like really was just a sanity check or or like order of magnitude. What like what, what ballpark financially are, are we looking at? And I think the next like to to make anything useful, any communication useful with any more companies, you and I need to or in Katarina and, and like, we just need to talk through wh what are we trying to accomplish with this building and mm -hmm. where would it go and how does it fit into the broader strategy? And, you know, how soon yeah. do we need to have people occupying it? Yeah, we're not there yet. So maybe leave this for now. Yeah. Or, you know, we got a sanity pause. check. We're like six. Yeah. Um, uh, one second, I gotta switch out my headphones. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I think Emerging Ventures grant and finishing the product like that. I think, I think that's where we need to be between now and the next meeting. Um, 
I don't know, I guess like be, being apprentice, we, we've done so much legwork for the apprenticeship and the, um, the like potential to have workshops. Um, I think we we're like in an execution phase now for Rosebud because that's driving mm -hmm. so many decisions. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's yes. my sense of it. And that's, and, and like also with the weather turning and, you know, I, I want to be realistic about your time. So that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and so for the EV application, um, I'm not sure if you want to link yourself or if you want me to go there for you. Oh, where is the EV application? It should just be, it should be searchable as Emergent Ventures application. But I'm having trouble. On your log? No, no, no. Um, well, yeah, part of it's linked there, but there's a separate page for it. Can you put in a link? Did you put a wiki page on it? Yeah, I got it. I'm mm -hmm. dropping the link now. Okay. Okay. So if you go to the logic model, if you edit that document. All right. Um, so I, I threw in some rough guesses of good places to start uh, working on a logic model. But more importantly, uh, I broke the application out. Um, just in this document so we could fill it out together. And so um, we can go through each of these if you want, but the bottom line is I started doing research and going back into previous things you've published and copy and pasting blurbs that I think fit within each section that needs to be submitted. And so you can think of the application as like, you know, administrative questions and then a proposal. And then the proposal within the proposal, they have three explicit expectations. Uh, the first one is like a brief, your story. The second one is, you know, choosing a consensus view that you absolutely agree with. And then the third is to pitch this specific work that you're doing and why they should fund it. Um, so, you know, I, I'm attempting to build a framework that you can go in there and fill out and then I can edit and we can just iterate like that. Um, unless mm -hmm. you think there's a better way to do it. Yeah, no, that's good. So we can work in this template. Did you, did you say beyond the 1500 propo word proposal, there's a pitch deck? No, no, no. Well, you can, there's a separate box to drop in supplementary material or supporting documentation, but the, the 1500 word proposal, they just, they just explicitly list three expectations. Tell us about yourself. Uh, describe a consensus view that you absolutely agree with and why should we invest in this thing or why should we give you money? And their exact wording is in bold. That's, that's copy pasted straight from the uh, app. Yeah, so back to the focus uh, um, and kind of wave going back to entire GVCS and this as a specific um, specific phase, I think build, probably get, create the narrative of now we're, so we got the GV, we got the GVCS, it's been around since 2008, but 
right now we're migrating to the CD Cajon as a way to bootstrap fund the actual project based on our learning. So expand on that and make a compelling story about it. So that's that's how I would approach it right now. Because because what I want to do is I want to do the GVCS. Now the recent turn of events says we're going to fund the revolution ourselves. And this is how we're going to do it. Okay. So CV go home as a, you know, revenue generating product. Mm -hmm. it, it's uh, completely consistent. It's all the, it's the open, open process. Uh, trying to emphasize that, that openness is the key to our success or open collaboration, because that's what we're trying to prove. We're trying to create the open source economy. So we have a story around that. Yeah. Uh, Cause right. I don't want to forget like if we get dive into the CD go home, I don't want to forget what this is after. And and what we're after still is 2028, just to summarize the, what's the clarity on where, where are we going? So as a leader, where is the movement going? Where, where do I want to take the world? I want to take the world to the full promise of unbridled um, access to prosperity. One, is um, <clears throat> how to phrase it in a way that's understood in today's language. One very broad way to think about it, which I never used until recently is financial independence, but that's the same thing as a decade ago, buyout at the bottom, sustainable livelihood, uh, regenerative livelihood, um, all of that filtered through economics is called financial independence something we can people can relate to or dem democratizing access to capital interestingly access to capital capital what that's wall street no it's really open source capital and i can actually link to the eight forms of capital or nine forms of capital the most important being open source know-how and tools and all that to unleash productivity so there's that uh, 2028 is a powerful tool set that enables you to do that in practice. And we've got successes and failures in how we're getting there. Lots of learning. And uh, the thing to look for is that that massive unleash, unleashing of, of productivity, creativity, and potential as described, but ah, who cares about that? Nobody no, nobody sees that's possible. That's a completely positive psychology, infinite index of possibilities kind of viewpoint. Uh, not a lot of customers, but we can frame it in with a very explicit package of the CD go home. Here's what we're doing specifically on this and, and, and how we relate our open development to transforming an industry. That's still our goal. So we can have this, this humble goal of changing housing, transforming housing wrapped in which is a, in itself a big audacious goal and wrapped into the bigger audacious goal of the open source economy. So I, I, I could see this coming together, yeah. Uh, so in 1500 words, I'll try to describe it with okay. every single word being a delicious morsel that they will just feast upon. I mean, I, I don't know if this is how you write, the way you're describing this, um, it's not the way I write. And I'm not an excellent writer, but my recommendation to you would be like, just throw stuff up on this document and let me help edit and add structure, wordsmith it later. Yeah, sure. You know, like, like I'm getting the impression that you want to, and like maybe you've done this before. Uh, you, I'm sure you're practiced at telling the story. Um, but this is my, this is my first time working with you on a, on a piece of writing. So like, um, I'm happy to defer to what makes you comfortable, but, um, I do think it's a mistake to jump right to the paper product first. To, mistake to do what? Jump straight into the finished product. So if you notice right now, like I have like the first section is the, the, what's the finished product? Sorry. What's oh, the, the finished app, product? The, app, the, the 1500 word proposal yeah so like right now under the you know your personal story i've got early life schooling and professional life and then starting ose and then i'm pulling quotes that i remember you saying in our conversations as sort of like jumping off points um mm -hmm. and so like the way i sort of see this going is like 
you spend 20 minutes here and there growing in like what's freshest on your mind and what what this brings up for you and then you know for keep going down this application like what resonates what doesn't what do you want to include what do you don't and then we can like piece it together later but, yeah um, sure so that, that yeah. i i don't know like i was thinking i guess what i'm really trying to say is like is that helpful for you or do you want me to just get out of the way yeah. or do you want me to be more no on? no i think i think i'll just uh hmm I mean, writing the 1500, let's start with that. Can I do yeah. that? Sure. But that's what that's what I think this is. Like, this is just the start of that, right? What 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 is um, all of the of all of the the italics that I've already put in? Like, these are concepts and this isn't refined product, but like, the, like, this is the starting point for the 1500 word proposal. Yeah, we got to weave it together. Why are, so in under point three, using a chronological Yeah, sure, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 there we go. It's about right, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's good. Oh, let me share my screen. Please let me. Oh, shit, fuck. I'm so bad at this. <laughs> no, 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 you're actually quite good all right there you go you should be so here i'm saying i'm just going to show you what i'm yeah 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 sure early life but that's you know that's like one third i can set the face set the stage for what this is about and and try to do that yeah like yes to those things but the next learning is yes this okay yes what happened there yes mud hut i mean that's not that's yeah it's part of it but not critical to the point yeah sure i, I can explain what that is um Now, how do I want to phrase this? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll just give you a first cut and see what you think about it. Mm -hmm. I, I'll just reiterate. I, I encourage you to be not as non judgmental as possible on yourself. Just just vomit some stuff on the page and we'll refine it later. Non judgmental about what? About what you put down. Just just vomit what's most you know most present for you and we can refine it later. Yeah, because uh I tried that right now and we have to of course that was like this hairy kind of an introduction to what I want to say. But yeah, I'll I'll develop that and write it down. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, uh, when when do we want to submit it? Uh, as soon as you're comfortable with it. It's rolling admission or it's rolling acceptance. Mm -hmm. And so you know, if okay. we, we could submit it in the next couple of weeks and next month, then I think we would still make the next cohort. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, let's do it. That's a start yeah. there. That's uh, we got some. You're getting it. You're, you're on track here, I think. Um, That's good to know.
Yeah. What yeah, was your goal with with the with this section here? I mean, I just I want to be able to think clearly and articulate clearly uh, OSC in a way that you would agree with. Yeah, you know, like I all the stuff in bold or in highlight is is my you know first rough attempt to capture like the big ideas. Um, I already see an issue. So like program goal, like we're not really improving their material well-being only, it's overall well-being, right? So like that's that could be something that changes. Um, but, you know, it, as a third party, it, it, without your experience, I also run the risk of overstepping or mischaracterizing what you're trying to do. And so I'm like, this is this is a good exercise for me, and I think it's a good exercise for the organization. So that similar to when you went on the TED stage, you probably had to go through like a a you know a lot of exercises to get the story right. Like for me, this is that version. Yeah, no, that's that's good. I like it. Cool. Um. So so that that was me. That's what I worked on. Uh, we're still waiting to hear back from Brian. Uh, you saw that email, and then I'm gonna mm -hmm. call. Travis um, today. That is, thanks for doing that. That sounds like right on. Okay. Uh, do we know anything about Travis? Is there a picture of him? Yeah, you can go to his website, um, catalystbuilt.com. Catalyst um, he's recommended by Jake Bruton. Jake Bruton's really well known, part of the Build Show, works with Matt Reisinger. I mean, he sounds like he's pretty interested, though. So that that would be cool. Right. That would be a <clears throat> yeah, great man. And they're in Ken Kansas City. They do a lot of work in Kansas City. I think they're in Kansas proper. Mm -hmm. Shawnee, this, and then move. Yeah, supporting future tradespeople is to go interdisciplinary, I'd say. And I, I really like all the stuff I read about housing is if you integrate, um, integrate the organization, there's some economics there that are breakthrough economics by integrating the skill set of individual players involved because there's too many people too many cooks i think that's that's a big part of it i think that's relevant to you know like okay tr how do you improve trades people well trades people don't necessarily have to do their own thing they if they can di diversify their skill set uh, they can be uh more valuable right yeah so, well the more i think about it the more like the current market for subcontractors limits people's progress, potential, participation. Um, there's there's like no incentive for the uh, carpenter to learn what the electrician is doing, other than to get out of their way and make sure they don't do something that screws up the inspector. So why don't they do the whole thing? Why don't they, they already do it? They say, why don't they uh, do multiple things? Um, why isn't there, I would like to understand more why more people aren't doing what we're trying to do. I don't get it because we have this insight that this could work, but I think it's the large skill set involved. You got to I mean, know my, too much. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my, my instinct was, you know, I, I learned how to do this shit on YouTube and by watching experts do it in like a very unstructured way. Mm -hmm. and so, so like, I'm, you know, I'm a city kid or I grew up in the suburbs. I never swung a hammer, but like, I, it, you know, if I can do it in my thirties, I, the point I'm trying to make is like, I don't think it's an information problem or a learning problem. I think this is like a culture problem. What do you mean by culture problem? Well, like very few people feel good about themselves if they spend their time refining their skills or learning how to put stuff together with their hands. Like it's not as central to how you might gain status. 
in society. If anything, you know, the past, my parents' generation kind of drilled it into our heads that if you didn't go to college, you were low status. And so we started to associate like education, formal education with status and, you know, trade informal education with like failing in some way or being less important to society. And I think a lot of it stems from that. Um, You're saying that that's a dis that's like that just depresses the, the trades people. I think it reduces they, the they are, they're not stimulated to be because they're not really seen. So if you're a you're a mono redneck versus a multifaceted redneck, you're still still a low life. <laughs> no. No. Yeah, no, I mean, no, that's no. What I'm Brutally speaking, is uh, that's what I'm hearing. Like, okay, because the trades do not have respect, when you get better at the trades, that still means you have no respect. Well, it, like here it gets complicated because there's saying? well, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of double speak out there. So like if you go if you talk to like it's 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 uh, it's in vogue nowadays to say that the trades are important. We need more young people going to trade schools and and so there it, like I think the culture is shifting to look upon or to be more skeptical of going to colleges as a guaranteed path to success. Um, I mean like the economic data still tells us that even if you take out student loans, college is the best single thing you can do to increase lifetime earnings. Like, let's forget that for a second and just go off perception. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that the culture is shifting to, like, and it's mainly for economic reasons. Like, the people who know how to do everything are aging out and they're struggling to hire people and the prices of things are going up. Like, prices of services to remodel your house have skyrocketed because of a shortage of skilled, reliable labor. And, you know, it's easy for people to say this is a big problem and we need to do something about it. But the, the like policy changes that would have to take place and other ways to move society toward that end state, I think are really, really tough to, <clears throat> to enact, which is why like what I think you're doing is so important because you have the opportunity to do like a grassroots viral cultural movement in a way that something like a bureaucracy can't. You mean startup entrepreneurship? Yeah, you can you can sh you can uh, create a predictable path to success, starting with a group of intrepid, motivated people that becomes like a mind virus. You start incepting the rest of society to actually believe, like, holy crap, if they can do it, I can do it. That is a really cool way to earn a living. You know, there's always a first mover problem, and and Brian Potter talks about this in that one article. Why isn't there innovation um, in construction? <clears throat> and one of the reasons or theories he has is it's a risk problem because if you take a risk to innovate in construction, you if, the, if it succeeds, all you've done is prove that you can you know build something and people are already building things. And so you're not like the payoff is relatively speaking not as high as the loss is going to be because failing to innovate or having an innovation fail is tremendously risky because buildings involve lots of stakeholders and lots of capital invested in them. And so like internalizing all that risk to innovate for something as intensive as a building is a challenge. It's, it's something that prevents innovation. What's the point about <clears throat> if you fail, it doesn't matter because people are already doing it. Is that another disincentive? Yeah, there's there's lots of substitutions or lots of sub market substitutes. Yeah. Therefore, like, who's going to support that? It's like, oh, it's already happening. We don't need to innovate. So part of it is that people don't recognize the the need. They think it's already. I think a lot of that is perception is that it's efficient. Part of it, <clears throat> or lack of awareness that innovation is needed. Um, I think you address the issue on um, for why um, systematically there's no more people going into trades, but we did not answer the question why aren't trades people diversifying into integrated operations? And I my my answer would be uh, that's a highly entrepreneurial endeavor, and you got to learn much more. So 
So there's barriers to that. There's learning, there's skill set, uh, mindset in terms of entrepreneurship, because you got to pretty much step out of it and say, okay, I'm actually going to change this. So uh, shouldn't expect a tradesperson to do that themselves. Yeah, fair. And credentialing. I mean, there are, there are regulations that incentivize people to, to specialize. Such as? Oh, like all the permits? Like to... to yeah, but what's... What do you mean by uh, by incentive, disincentive? Like, uh, oh, how does that disincentivize <clears throat> me? Uh, because it it costs money to take those tests oh, and get that training. Because there's uh, more, and you're still just working. You're saying there's the, you there's now the two tests. right, right, not, and not to mention the fact that. Um, like you need certain credentials to sign off on certain sized buildings, let's say. Like you need mm -hmm. a master, you need to be a master electrician to sign off on work done in a commercial building, let's say. Um, right. And that successful permit or that successful inspection is so valuable to a commercial developer that they're only gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna pay whatever amount, like the cost if they fail the inspection of additional work and delayed you know, delaying the project is so high that they're willing to pay such a high premium for that master level certified person to come inspect it, that there is a real incentive for people to be hyper specialized so that they can be in the position to be hired by that commercial developer. You don't mean the inspector, you mean the actual contractor? Well, no, or yeah, yeah, sure. I see. So the disincentive is that um trying to get the logic of the market there this incentive is that uh the person who's hiring those people is going to want the super specialist so 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 there's the builder say, say the developer let's say developer someone who's developing they're going to want the best of the best the print the apprentice the the tradesperson wants to think, oh, yeah, 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 I'm that best person. I'm going to just get this one license. I'm going to specialize in it. They, and maybe the barriers to that uh, are unnecessarily high. I would, well, I would look at it that way. They're unnecessary. Because, for example, look at an example of me. Like, I can get the electrical contractor thing. Now, for the Sidika home, I'm going to use a small subsection of all the laws that are out there because our design is simple. But I guess I can see the disincentive on that. It's, oh, well, you still got to know everything, even though you're using um, a small fraction of it. So, yes, that would be a disincentive. I mean, something that comes up for me is when I learned about current and circuits, electrical engineering, the first like 101 class that I had, the analogy that they use is a pump and water and potential, you know, potential energy in a water tower. And so like, I think that the financial incentive to be hyper-specialized so that you can be like uh, unquestioned in your ability to sign off on that big stuff to, to minimize the risk for big firms. Like that's where the big money is. Let's say that financial incentive disincentivizes people early in the career from viewing the trades as more of like a scientific pursuit. And when I say scientific, I mean, like if you're a plumber, you kind of know a little bit about electrical engineering, but nobody's really connected those dots for you. And it, like, to me, this is, goes beyond the trades and it's more of a question of like, what does education mean? Like, what's the value of education? Uh, why do we learn about the world around us? Like, why is science important? Well, like, it's because as a plumber, I need to know why we have to ground certain pipes because <clears throat> moving water creates current, like, like electrons in a copper wire. If we don't ground the pipes, so there's a risk of static discharge. And if the static discharge is in a bakery where there's a lot of oxidizer floating around, then that's a you know combustion risk. As opposed to like you just need to know this code and do it this way. And I think that like 
I'm imagining a world in which like young people who don't go to college for physics can use the trades as sort of this gateway to like understand how physics and chemistry and all this other stuff interact with each other in a practical sense in a sense that relates to their day-to-day life and like to me that's the ultimate level of empowerment um and why what empowerment you know, you, you can you can manipulate your environment to to benefit you, right? Um, I don't know. May, maybe it's a pipe dream. Maybe it's. Um, I'm I'm confused. Why yeah. are you saying that the, the way it's structured? Like, I, I I'm confused on what's your message about um, you're somehow disincentivizing science. Uh, can you elaborate, please? You said something about, you must have some point there about how the overall structure of this kind of disincentivizes you from having a good scientific understanding, the whole, the way the whole thing works. Is that what you're saying? I mean, it's, I think, I think they're related. I, I'm not sure there's a causal relationship. To me, this is more like correlation, but um, I mean, just if I think, if I think about in terms of stereotypes and culture and norms, like when I was growing up, you had the group of people who were going to go to college and they were going to get professional jobs and everybody else and everybody else. Like it was assumed that if you didn't go to college, you were bad at school or you got bad grades. In other words, you were dumb. And so if you go, if you, if you, you know, sort of project that level of expectation on a group of young people, and then you, they enter the trades, they may enter the trades without any sort of, like bridge between the shit that they're doing on the job site and the concept that they were learning in school when in fact they're very closely linked and you know as a result of that there's no like there's no uh without that connection the thing that drives them in that job potentially could could be the financial motivation and right now the financial incentives are primarily to be a specialized uh, trades person to get the highest little level certification that you can in that trade to make the most money. And I think when we talk about overlap and ah. cross training and all that, other, yeah. Wait, uh, are you saying that so in exchange for being dumbed down, <laughs> dumbed down, I accept that as a tradesperson because I get good pay. Is that kind of there's a little subverse, little uh, perverse incentive there? You're saying? I'm not sure I follow. Oh man, I, mean, like, I, I, I'm kind of, I also I also want to take a step back. Like I'm not I don't, I'm not trying to make big sweeping claims here. Like that I'm more sort of taking the temperature on, you know, my impression of why people get into the trades, why more young people in like currently aren't interested in doing it. And like, you know, some of the, the forces that are affecting that and what the possible implication. Okay, I'm seeing this this perverse incentive here is that, oh, well, as a tradesperson, I get to make a lot of money from this specialization. And therefore, I don't need to pursue the, mm, the so-called liberal education or research education, kind of the, the higher tracks of research and development. So they're kind of whisked out of it because of that high pay, which is whisking talent away, which otherwise could have gone to a, a higher level, so-called higher level of education. Maybe. I don't no, know. That, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but what I can say is that, okay, so I think the, the, our approach to this is like, this is not really about the trades. Like the way we position this for, for veterans or people that work with us as world changers is we're, ta we're talking about entrepreneurial mindsets and movement entrepreneurs. That's kind of like the framework. It's like, if you want to be more entrepreneurial, come to us. If you want a regular gerb, go somewhere else. So here it's the vision of make, making a difference. And also the enterprise thing, the, the skill set of ultimately learning about yourself for the highest level of leadership from good to great. I mean, I, I would go I deeper and say problem solving. 
I mean, like if you if you want to solve problems that matter to you, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'm, this conversation kind of spun out of. Uh, I'm just confused why more people aren't doing the kind of approach that we're taking, which is integrate, transcend and include, skill up, enterprise, and save the world. Well, I think I, mean, I kind of said it, it's a big package yeah. to take on. I mean, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot recently, and I don't claim to have anything figured out, but I, you know, I think there's a lot of assumptions in people's minds about like, employ like uh, entrance to the labor market being rational actors who are guided by self-interest and predictable and manipulable through wage mechanisms and all this sort of stuff and like i think i think a lot of that analysis and like that approach misses um a lot of you know the human connective fuzzy stuff and so like, if you're asking why more people aren't taking this approach, it's because there's no easy lever to pull to minimize risk and maximize payoff. Like what we're dealing with is like sticky human, you know, getting people in a room together, collaborating. And so right now it's an opt-in, but eventually I think, you know, as, as success scales here with, you know, the amount of work that you've put into it, um, I think there's a pull, like there's a bug light effect that's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's cool. That's cool. So yeah. So um, anyway, where to from here? I think. Oh, yeah. Just, uh, uh, innovate. I mean, I would say that uh, we should just come up with our priorities for the next week and keep marching along like that. Yeah. Uh, I'm building stuff, and and uh, do you want me to work on uh, so put some time into the emergent ventures? Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, I I would say it would be helpful to me if you threw in topics that you want to cover, um, phrases that capture sort of like you know uh, sound bites or whatever the thing the the things that you're practiced at saying and telling the story or concept you want to include, and then we just iterate until. We're ready to start like really editing and, and making it a cohesive 1500 word proposal. Mm -hmm. And I'm taking notes here. So, oh, 1500 ads. words. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm also going to keep connecting. To you know, see if we can get Brian scheduled and Travis. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, that's that Travis. I think could be good, good thing. Um, I think the thing with Berkebeal being an architect. I think that discussion we were talking about potential charrette and all that. I I think. Not sure what the discussion on that last was, but my impression from Petrina was that they um, didn't sound like a good fit. There wasn't like a lot of interest from the people at Beanham. I'm not sure. I'm, um, I'm not sure like, I know not what not the sure story that. is here. I think I can follow up on that because um, we did talk to some people, but but you get two kinds of people that are basically basically listen to you and people who just tell you, no, this is how I would do it, uh, regardless of like without really considering the constraints or opportunities that we have. So we kind of didn't um, didn't feel like um, we were exactly being listened to. Like a lot of people can provide different different feedback, but the most valuable is like when it's when they really stop and listen and just throw all their assumptions away. Yeah. And I'm not sure I'm not sure that was there, uh, but I could check in on that to, to evaluate. Because I I mean I, I think about. A lot about okay, how are we being collaborative? And um, that aspect we gotta bring out in this work. And I think you know we're in a stage of the build. And but once the product release comes, like February second, February first, or whatever, um, uh, my effort will shift much more to the okay. Let's talk about more collaboration, like things like who, like the research, like who is actually solving housing right now? You know, who are the key players? 
like if we talk about these startups that try to break through in housing, what are they doing? How are they doing it? Just studying the whole field and making it into a problem statement that's more than ours. It's okay, here's how you generically how you solve housing across the board. What are the key issues? So um, and involving people around those. That's that's the kind of way we want to roll. Um, so right now, kind of I'm I'm in a in a weeds uh, just building, but but want to really get much into that. That's the space I thrive more in, in terms of um, getting people to collaborate. Right. Yeah. Um, I should yeah. also probably mention, um, I have potential connections with Habitat for Humanity. Now uh, that would be an awesome one. So yeah. it's like, so we've talked to some people, but that's for some reason uh, that's like never coming through. I never really pursued anything aggressively, but um no there it's if you look at their annual report i look at the wiki i think i put yeah. it up there okay uh, man they are they seem to have really good impact They're, they seem to be growing quite a bit they, they pretty much like really took off in the last few years so yeah. i'd love, love to see that and learn from them. i mean they've got a model that works they've got a 400 hour sweat equity model yeah uh, it's, I'd like to talk to somebody in their leadership to to really discuss like okay what have you learned how is this working because they've been around and they're they're getting traction. So and, it, yeah, yeah. It, if I could get you connected, um, you know, I, I can just repeat that. You know, you're 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 curious about salt like the attempts to solve affordable housing generally and what they've learned. Yeah. Um, their figures are like, um, let me see what I've got. Like as far as like, so, you know, so this is part of our competitor slash collaborator audit. Um, for humanity. For humanity. Okay. So, well, like there, let me share my screen. That's what they're doing. Look at that. Mm -hmm. And that's like exponential growth. Now, annual report, where is that? Um, report okay so look at I, I saw this one page here like their raw stats so let's look at um, they had one for North America may not be the one but they, um, I was trying to look at their numbers. Like, how many new homes do they actually build? I think that number was like around ten thousand or so per year. That's pretty good. Right. Um, how exactly do they work? No, I mean, there's. Uh, I'd love to see some good case study of it. Like, uh, um, if you run into anything, like there must be some interviews with their leadership or anything, maybe somewhere in some enterprise channels. But I'm really curious about what they're doing and how they're doing because apparently they're just exploding right now. As you saw in the graph, I mean, the graph is kind of like what I'm going by. It's like uh, this graph, or is that just marketing? No, it seems pretty real. That's since 76, they're kind of going along. And then just like, I mean, right now, 2019, pretty rapid growth um, since about 2012, you know, 2010, uh, uh, kind of like hit the knee at, like 2015, which is very recent history. So they're, they're someone to study. I mean, yeah. it's increasing, but this graph is cumulative. Oh, is that what I'm missing on that? So it looks, I mean, it's still, okay. impre it's still impressive. It's, um, It's cumulative, but it's also, but the trend there is looks, looks exponential though. Like if you right. go from 
like 2012, the annual increase there seems to be, well, especially this jump here when you're doubling, you know, here, like you're significant like 20... here, like you're more than doubled, like, right. whoa, well, that's, that's interesting. Is that real or is that the way they did their metrics? Um, Cause if that's the case, then they stayed the same between 2018 and 19, but yeah, this trend here is, It's still impressive. Uh, yeah. But I, I think if they were building uh, a million homes a year, more people would know about it. it or I should say. But still, yeah, so it's still impressive. Uh, yeah, so if you look at 10,000, I mean, is that enough to make a dent? Um, the amount of houses per year in the United States, they're around, what is it, I think a million? I think it's about a million. Uh, so they're getting, if it's 10,000, it's 1%. So 1%, I mean, of a large number, that's significant. Yeah, but well, anyway. Um, okay. Bless you. Thank you. All right. Feeling good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, really good. Great. Me too. All right. Um, well, I look forward to next week, and um, I sh should be okay if my flight, in a, you know, uh, gets in the way. I'll let you know. Oh, by the way, man. Uh, actually, let's. Can we go back to the six p.m. 5.30 or 6 p.m. Next week. Would that work? Yeah. Uh, forever. Katrina is not making the meetings, and this is like the middle of the day. Yeah. Where it's yeah. honest. Sure. So, okay, so uh, if you can send me that invite. That'd be yeah, great. absolutely. Uh, 6 p.m. your time? Yeah. Okay, got it. Changing it. Would five, is 5.30 any better for you? Um, no, not really. Because Tali ta okay. goes down at 6.37, so that's perfect. Okay. All right. Great. Excellent, excellent. So, yeah. All right, well, um, get back out there. Yeah. <laughs> EV, coming right up. All right, man. Okay. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.